Good afternoon. Welcome to Larry Rinker Golf Live. We're going to be live here on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for the next hour. And I'm pleased to be joined by my sister, Lori Rinker. She is uh, won the 1980 U.S. Girls Junior, was a two-time All-American at the University of Florida. She has two LPGA Tour wins, won the J.C. Penny Classic with yours truly, also a win on the LPGA Japanese Tour, and is currently playing the Legends Tour. Good afternoon, Lori. Hi, Larry. How are you doing? Doing well, and my other guest has been a golf teaching professional since 1982, is a top 100 teacher, and has created Right Balance, a golf instruction roadmap that identifies your dominant core region and what your swing characteristics and setup characteristics are based on that. That would be our friend, Dr. David Wright. Good afternoon, Doc. Good afternoon, Larry. Well, it's great to have both of you here. And Doc, uh, I'm going to put some slides up, but you know we uh, we have some things where we're uh, you know we we can talk about the and talk about the. Let's just see here. I'm just trying to get this pulled up here, but you can see here that with you, Doc, there's a right balance, three swing models. And we really get into these core regions. So talk a little bit about the nine core regions, Doc. Well, the nine core regions, starting with the lower core, they're color-coded in blue here, from the pelvic floor uh, to the navel is the lower core, uh, of the lower core. Uh, then you have middle, uh, which is region four, five, and six in black. Uh, that's the middle core, that would be Lori, and seven, eight, and nine is upper core, uh, and that would be you, Larry. And we're, we're talking about our areas uh, where our bodies work best in the golf swing, and each of us are representative of one of those regions. Yeah, so it's interesting. That. You've been a low core player your whole life, so that means that Hogan was great for you, reading his five fundamentals. <laughs> he was. And I thought, as a golf professional, that's what I taught. Uh, it worked for me, but it, as it turns out, in men, it only works for about 10% of the population. So I see walking wounded out there uh, that I taught <laughs> over the years, trying to teach everyone what I did. And it, does, it works so well for women. Most women are mid and lower. Most men, most tour winners are mid, and uh, but sixty-six percent of the population of men are upper core players. So let's look at some video here, Doc. So we're going to look at uh, we're looking here at Lori Rinker on the right, a mid core player, and then Kathleen, who is my low core player. So some characteristics, Doc, of the low core player. Really want to focus on four things their grip, their pivot, how rotated are their hips at impact, and where is their release point. So just talk through this as I run this video of Kathleen. Okay. Well, first of all, to address, you could see a very strong grip. Notice the level plane of the shoulders at the top. You know, see how under she is there. Level plane of the shoulders, and you'll notice how under she is at the top as well. Her center of mass, her pivot, is over trail side here. Right. And as she starts down, you'll notice the under delivery and notice how much her hips clear by impact. You'll notice how much clearance she has of the hips. If you look at her right foot, she's up on the toes of her right foot. That's showing a lot of hip clearance. Right. And at She's really clear. Notice her right elbow, her trail arm delivery is under, and it's inside that right hip. Right, and if we look at her from uh, if we look at her from down the line, the low core player has a posture where they stand up the most and then have the most knee flex, don't they? Yeah, that thigh angle and spine angle and the low core player match. 
they're going to be identical. That's the only core region where they are identical. And she's going to, uh, so she's going to have, uh, she's going to look very symmetrical at her dress. So if we look at Lori Rinker, when you see her at a dress, quite different posture, isn't it? Yes. You see a little more spine angle there. A little more forward bend. Yep. And one thing that we talk about a lot, and you say this all the time to me, is really it's about balance so that low core player, the balance is in the middle of the feet. And the upper core player, the balance is in the balls of the feet. And then Lori's is in between those two, isn't she? That's correct, yes. So as we look at Lori's swing, Lori, you can talk through this. Well, I'm going to have a little weaker grip than the low core and quite not quite as strong as weak as the upper core. So as I go back, I will have some hip rotation. My plane will be more on a torso plane. And as I come through, I'll have some hip rotation, not as much as a low core. And my release point will be a little sooner than the low core, but not as soon as the upper core so yeah so it's interesting looking that... doc looking at kathleen versus Lori. kathleen's your low core your dustin johnson's your lee trevino paul azinger david duvall jordan spieth and then you look at Lori. that's your typical tour player isn't it that's where you see a lot of your tour winners are right there in the mid core just as Lori is so here's a swing everybody wishes that they had, Adam Scott. So here's just this, what people would call most perfect swing. And look how on plane he is and look at impact and look how similar Lori looks to Adam Scott there at impact, Doc. Yeah, absolutely. They're close to identical. Look at the hip clearance. Yeah, and with the shaft points at impact as well, pointing to the mid-core region. So if you look at yours truly, so now we're talking about an upper core player. If you look at me, you are going to see that I'm going to be where my, I'm going to jump and stand up and now I'm not going to have any hip rotation and impact. So there's upper core, isn't it? Yeah, that's a great illustration of upper core. Notice the, uh, the launch position there, using a lot of the ground vertically. And my whole career, I kept thinking I needed to look like Lori Rinker. My brother Lee and I got kidded all the time that your sister has the best swing in the family. That'd still be the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting how... We can go from Kathleen at Impact to me at Impact, oh. and we can teach everything in between as well, can't we, Lori? That's right. And we can't get stuck on one model because one model doesn't work for everybody. And most people would look at your position and say, oh, that's not good. He has no hip rotation at Impact. Right. But it's very good for you. Yeah, and a lot of people talk about staying in posture and keeping your butt on the wall, and we're going to early extend and stand up, aren't we, Doc? Absolutely, Larry. You're going to be posturing up here, uh, and that's really where you're getting your power. You're getting your power rotationally and vertically. Here. Right, so, at... so let's just talk a little bit about our uh, the upper core swing. So we have the weakest grip, our pivot, our pivot is around, more around the front leg, isn't it, Doc? We're, we're going to pivot the most around the front leg. And again, if we look at Kathleen's pivot, she's going to move the most laterally and turn the hips the least, isn't she? Yeah, absolutely. Now you can see the difference in the hip rotation here. Right. Do you have to have Lori where you could put her up at that position as well there, Larry? 
Yeah, Lori is uh, very centered. She is over the ball. So here's Lori's pivot. So you can see she has a little bit more movement laterally to toward her right foot than I do. She's what some might call a center post. Yes. So Lori, really, when you get set up correctly, I mean, you're not you're not worried about trying to hit positions going back. You really are just letting the club swing naturally back to the top, aren't you? Yes, I do. I uh, Once I get set up correctly with my posture and my grip, and I just swing the club back and don't interrupt it with my thinking, it, it'll swing back to the right position. Right. So a lot of what right balance does is get you set up in the right position with posture, grip, and alignment which is pga but once i have all those then it swings back to the top in a nice position so the upper core player turns the most and moves the least amount laterally the mid core player turns not quite as much and moves a little more laterally and then doc kathleen our our low core player moves laterally the most with the least rotation in the backswing. Backswing, it has great rotation in the down. That's where the power comes from. Uses the ground very differently than the upper core player. Uses it rotationally and linearly, linearly or laterally, horizontally. And then there's a big difference in what happens now. That low core player shifts and rotates like crazy. And has a, they're the ones that are turning and lagging. Whereas the upper core player rotates into a jump to impact, don't they, Doc? Yes, and your release there is going to be much sooner than the um, lower core player. So I call it release point. Where is that point in the swing where the butt of the club points back at the center of the chest, the right arm has thrown or is straightened? And the left arm is straight as well. So you can see my release point is just a little bit past impact. And where where do you think Kathleen's release point is, Doc? Right there. Wow. Quite different. And then Lori you know, would be in, Lori would be in between those two, wouldn't you, Lori? Yes. So here's your release point. And here you are coming in. There's impact and your release point's probably right up in here somewhere. Right up there. That's mid-core right there. So the big thing, Lori, in teaching today is things have to match up. And so what we're showing is what is your grip? What's your pivot? How do you shift? How do you slot that club? And where's your release point? Is it early? Mid-core a little uh, later, and then low-core has that latest release, don't they? That's right. So everybody's different, and we have to teach each person individually to what matches them. Well, what's interesting to me, Lori, is what in, in the first year of studying this, 90 or 66 percent doc were upper core that's what i had and i think i had maybe four percent low core and the rest were mid core and because of me being upper core and promoting upper core with writing an ebook i'm now running 90 percent upper core and as you said earlier, men, especially if they've received their AARP card in the mail, they're prob they've got a high degree of being upper core, don't they, Doc? They do. <clears throat> well, and I think as we age, in terms of flexibility and speed, we're going to see players can change core positions, uh, especially if you're mid and low. As you age, you're able to move up the core and actually make a change in swing. 
it's a stance width change, it's a grip change, it's a posture change. Yeah, and Doc, if we if we go back to uh, if we go back here to our core regions and look at our slides again, so now we can say I'm a nine. By the way, I'm the top of this. Uh, I'm the top of this upper core here, you know, which to me is pretty interesting. I'm a nine right here. Lori, you're a six, and Doc. Uh -huh. are you one or a three? No, I'm a one. You're a one. And what I find, Doc, is a lot of my students are sevens and nines or nines. And we, we talk about the six and seven as being a hybrid. They could be a blend right between an upper and a mid-core player, just like the threes and the fours. So... Talk a little bit, Doc, about uh, the core regions. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring something up here, as far as uh, you know, showing that what we do here. So I think one of the uh, one of the cool things, Doc, is talk about how we actually identify what somebody's number is. Well, we, uh, we do body measurements. We assess height, weight, uh, shoe size, and then we measure the shoulder width and we measure the sternum uh, outside of the edge of each arm. And we have an algorithm, it's all online. We have an al algorithm that gives us a printout that actually identifies stance widths for your lower core, for your middle core, and your upper core. So when you go to those stance widths, Say so you're in an upper core stance with you had a little bit of knee flex, you actually feel the weight in the balls of the feet. If you go to a lower core stance with you actually feel the weight over the center of the arches. And if you go to a mid core stance with, uh, you'll be as you, as you described earlier, where Lori would be, you'll be between the balls of the feet and the center of the arches. So yeah, so the, the low core player is there in blue and right. And then that uh, upper core player, we're going to be in the balls of the feet. And then that uh, Lori, that mid core player, they're in between, aren't they? Yes. Now, these numbers are, we use, a Fibonacci numbers are used to determine these stance widths. I'm not going to go into that in any more detail here, but just to say that they are a Fibonacci sequence. So we take the first three stance widths of the lower core. So each core region has between five and seven stance widths in this printout. So we take the first three stance widths of each of one, uh, one two, and three of the lower. Uh, we take the first three out of the mid core and the first three out of the upper core. And we plot those on a yardstick as you have them here. <clears throat> and what we did is that all players, I've had players in from ready to go to the combine. They only have body symmetry in one of these nine core regions. They only have balance. Their hips are square uh, in only one of these. Their hands hang the same in only one of these nine stand splits. We call that the dominant core region. From there, <clears throat> what we've learned is that you may test as a low core. And I don't know if you have this uh, slide there, Larry, but external shoulder rotation is really the determining factor because that's going to give us the trail arm delivery. So when we're assessing a player, they may have strength like me, uh, where I'm a one, but they don't have any external shoulder rotation uh, in a one position, which basically means they cannot get that trail arm in position, the trail arm for a one lower core player would be an under delivery, which means they're going to be uh, uh, that it, right elbow has to be able to get inside that right hip. And if they can't, they're going to have to move up the core to a different region. Yeah, I'm just looking for that video uh, to show you that. But I think one thing that you're talking about here while we have this up is see, here's our low core. 
characteristics that we went over with the video. So that low core player, strongest grip, they pivot around their trail leg, most lateral. So they shift the most and have the least amount of rotation and then their hips are rotated the most at impact, latest release. And then Lori, the mid core player, their grip is not as strong as a low core. They're not as weak as upper. Their center pivot in between. They're moderate, you know, they, they shift and rotate and uh, their hips are that, I, you know, that what we always have thought was the perfect swing dock, you know, 45 degrees rotated at impact and then the mid release point. And then we have the upper core player, weakest grip, pivot around the front leg, earliest release, hips rotated the least. And now let's just talk a little bit, Doc, about this carrying angle because this is really how we determine our grip, isn't it? It is. And, and, and by the way, I won't go back into it in depth. The angle you're measuring here, unless there's a structural issue with the shoulder, is also external shoulder rotation. So the carrying angle is measured uh, in the dominant arm. And you can see that uh, digital protractors going down. It's probably a reverse image here. Going down, it's going down your left arm here. But right. down the middle of the forearm, 90 degrees to the ground. That digital protractor gives us a uh, the number of degrees. So 160 plus is going to be 159, 60, 62, 64, 65, whatever. Is you really your upper core player? <clears throat> that carrying yeah. angle is the angle of range of motion throughout the entire body. It's going to be in the low core player. It's going to be uh, the uh, thigh angle and the spine angle. This is the angle we were talking about earlier. It's going to be the angle of the uh, right arm down the shaft at address, uh, face on. It'll be the angle of the left arm and shaft down the line. So it is, and it shows up in multiple places at address and all the way through the swing. Room. There you go. That's the right arm face on down the shaft. Right. And this angle repeats throughout the swing. Right, and so if we if we go back to uh, our slideshow here, and we just look at this carrying angle, now we take this, and now there's how we get our left hand grip, isn't it? So that's yeah. that's that carrying angle. That's the left hand grip, and then there's my right hand grip if my carrying angle matches in both arms. We do have some players. My brother Lee has a weak right hand grip. So, Doc, we definitely see golfers that their right hand is going to be on top for a right hand yeah, yeah. player. Right. 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 The uh, And the thing you see there, Larry, we t I talked a moment ago about uh, range of motion. The thing you see is that when you have that right hand position, that right hand dictates range of motion through the swing. So if you hold your hand in that position and rotate in the through swing, you'll see maximum rotation. If you change that grip at all, you will, uh, you'll see a restriction in motion. Same on the left side. Right hand is the through swing, left hand is the back swing. So I'm gonna bring up uh, V1 again and, and just show this here where now I've got my right hand on top and you can see how much I turn. And now I'm going to put my right hand where it should be and notice the difference in the rotation. And it's always a voodoo moment, Lori, when you do this with your students, when you show them the difference of where their grip is and then really what's optimal for them as far as range of motion and how much they can turn. Yes, it is. They uh, think just put your hands on where they feel feel good, and that's not necessarily the case. It could be the case, but there's an ideal spot for your hands, your left and right hand, to be on the club. So here I am with my hand, and you know it's it's basically we get this, you know, somewhere right in here. You can see well that's a that's kind of a low core number, but if we draw it here we can see that 
you know, there's 159, which actually is my carrying angle. So we'll, we'll put that in yellow so people can see it in yellow. But, uh, but Lori, yours is a little, little more than mine. And then Kathleen, she would be Doc. She would have more of an angle. She's going to be, you know, in that 149, 150 range as a low core yeah, player, isn't she? That's exactly it. Yeah, that's that's more that under position there. Yeah. So so if we look at Kathleen hitting an iron here, this is one thing we see that that carrying angle affects ball position, doesn't it? It does. So her ball that's position good. is back in her stance, and so now. Created by yeah, that's created by grip and Chaplin there. You'll see how much more Chaplin Kathleen has here than than you or Lori. So she's going to have the ball back with a fairly straight line with the left arm and her shaft, and now she's going to in her pivot not turn much and then shift and rotate like crazy. And you can see the strength of her grip at impact right there, and yeah. how rotated she is now. There's no way, Doc, I could ever be there. I physically cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> you would have a back injury trying to get there, Larry. That's what you tried to do. That's what I tried to do, but then I realized, hey, this is my swing. My hands are back a little bit further here at address. And now here's my pivot. My right hip starts with the club as an upper core player. There's my little shift, and look at me at impact compared to Kathleen. So nothing wrong with my impact position. It's just a lot of people would want to see me look like Lori. Here's Lori at impact. So, you know, uh, Lori's got more hip rotation. Definitely would see it better down the line, Lori. There you are at impact. And then here I am down the line at impact. So, <laughs> quite different. Quite different. And That's a, those are great images, Larry, because it's such a, a good differentiation. And you're just one core region away. <clears throat> right. Different. You may be one inch away, as you talked the other day. Well, the interesting thing that a mid-core teacher is going to tell an upper core player like myself, and this is what I heard a lot, was A, I need to get my hips more rotated. B, I need more forward shaft lean at impact. So if my hands are a little more forward, I could have a little more forward shaft lean. And then the other thing they would say is, hey, you got to stay in this posture here when I stand up. Right. <laughs> so that's the three things that they'll tell us. And Lori... When the body rotation gets ahead of the arm, hand, and wrist swing, what happens to the club face at impact? It opens up. So what do you think happened when I tried to rotate more, stay in posture, and get more forward shaft lean? Where do you think I hit the ball? You probably hit it right of right. So what do you think the next thing they wanted to change for me was? Strengthen your grip so you can square the club head. And what happens when I strengthen the grip, Doc? What what happens to my ability to turn on the backswing? Well, your stronger grip is going to limit your rotation in the backswing. Yeah, it doesn't fit your net, doesn't fit your angles. Right. So see, there's my carrying angle at 159, and then that matches up with my left hand grip being about there as a guess. But if I strengthen that, I lose rotation in the backswing, which, as far as I'm concerned, Doc, the most important thing for an upper core player is to make a good turn in that backswing, turn that right hip, and don't sway. Everything, get, yes. And the center of mass target side with a big turn. So let's go back to our slides. And I just want to bring something up here that so people can see this but i just want to show uh these stance widths again so what can i say one, uh you're going there larry your your right hand position needed to be a needed to be stronger for you to be able to turn through but some upper core players 
as you mentioned, need to be on top as right. well. Right. Yeah. So either one could work. You want to test both. So when we look at when we when you do when we measure people, Doc, and I've now measured over eight hundred people, but when we take these four measurements, we get their height, weight, shoulder width, sternum width, shoe size. <clears throat> that goes into an algorithm that spits out all these stance widths. So there's your two, and there's your six, and there's your three, and there's your eight, four. Uh, my seven's not on here because it's the widest one, but you can see the differences in the stance widths here, can't you? You have about an inch there between uh, number eight region, number four region. Yep. And as, as we talk about this, Larry, we this these stance widths are extremely nice. There's a lot of science behind this. So if I put you in a three region stance width and you add knee flex, you're going to be right over the center of the arches. If I were to put you in a seven, you'd be right over the balls of the feet. And if I put you in a five stance width, you're going to be in between those two positions. Right. So you're talking about if we look left at the skeletons, if if we go for a three stance width right here, that weight's going to be over the arches. That's right. So if I draw it in my feet, there it is, over the middle of my feet. And then if I go to... Then if I go to Lori, which she's a six, she's going to be in front of that. And then when you get to me, upper core, we're going to be here. We're going to be in the ball. Yes. Now, what's yes. interesting, Doc, and Lori, you can comment on this. How many times have you had somebody stand in their nine stance width? They stand straight up and down and you say, OK, where's your balance? And what are they going to say, Lori? They're going to say, it feels like it's on my toes. And then when you put them in their one stance width, which is only two inches narrower, what they are they going to say? They feel like it's more back and they're not on their heels, but more back than it was when in the nine stance width. And then so, if they go two inches wider than their nine into their five stance width, they're going to feel in between, aren't they, Doc? Right. So that's really the science, Doc, to me. You know, your whole algorithm of we, we get your height, we get your weight, your shoulder, your sternum width, shoe size, and now everybody has low, mid, and upper core stance widths. And when they stand in them, that creates balance in the balls of the feet over the arches or in between the arches and the balls of the feet. Right, right. And as you said earlier, Larry, absolutely everything we are seeing here is the angle where there's the grip, it's all out of the foundation, ground, uh, and uh, everything is balanced. Absolutely everything is balanced. So, Lori, when somebody stands in the nine stance width and they feel their weight in their toes, as you say, the balls of their feet, and you ask them to turn through the ball, what happens to their hips? They have very little rotation going through as is in a follow through. So they will, like you do in your swing, want to stand up. So that's right. an eye opening experience when people feel that. Yeah, it is because, uh, you know, they, they really are not going to rotate. So I pulled this up today, doc. I, I shot this. Uh, well, I've, I've got to stop sharing this screen here, but if I, uh, I want to I want to show you. I, I get asked all the time. Well, who are the upper core swings on tour? So here I was at the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach last summer. Here's Webb Simpson. Now this is a gentleman that won the Players Championship last year. Uh, he oh, actually Rory won it. He won it two years ago. But meanwhile, he had a great year. He played on the Presidents Cup team down in Australia in December. So watch this swing. So you're going to see the club come a little inside. You're going to see the club on plane. And how rotated is Webb Simpson at impact, Doc? 
Not at all. There's your upper core swing. There's your upper core swing, and there's a young man who's, what, 30, 35 maybe? So, he doesn't even have an AARP card, Larry. No, he doesn't. You know, but it's interesting, Doc, if we watch the next few frames, look, he's still not rotated. Right. Now, if you watch this swing, if you watch him, it looks in full motion. You see him at the end go like that and turn through with his chest. So a lot of people just see that. So it looks like, wow, he really turned through. But that's one of the interesting things, Doc, when we can slow-mo swings is we can really see that these people... Uh, if somebody's really that rotated at impact or not. Now look at that face where now, how quickly it's it's exiting left there. Yep. Well, and just look at the club face going through. He's got an up release, which is going to help him hit the ball straighter. That's a great thing if somebody's hooking the ball. Release that club more up, Lori. That was an old Peter Costas thing, wasn't it? That sure was. Uh, but that's just really a great way to release the club. And, you know, it's just so interesting, you know, looking at these swings, how, you know, I'm going to try and bring up, uh, you know, some other swings here of some players that people know. But, you know, you look at Rory, Doc. Uh, Rory rotates into a jump. When we look at his swing mm -hmm. on video, he's not that rotated at impact. Here's an old Rory right here. So we're going to see, see, look at how they almost stall there as he goes vertical. He does stall a little bit, by the way. He actually had a little recoil and then he finishes. Yep. But it's interesting, Doc, that I get asked a lot well, which one's the best swing, low, mid, or upper? And I always say, well, it's the one that works for you the best. Absolutely. And it's what's next for the body. And a lot of the uh, long drive guys are mid core because they're using verticals and they're using, uh, you know, a lot of ground force. They're jumping through the ball. That's a big difference between, say, a Rory and a Spieth, isn't it? Yes. Because you know, when we look at Spieth, He's not really using the ground that much, is he? No, he's uh, he's much more in a lower core. He sits down through the swing. He uh, From the top, he sits down and then turns through and clears his hips. So this was somebody shot this, but just look how quickly Spies weight. Look at his weight in his left heel. Can people jump out of their heels, Lori? Not very well. <laughs> so do you think he can go vertical from there, Doc, with that no, weight? No. And see, a lot of people don't realize how rotated Jordan is at impact. Now, he was one of the first players. He and Dustin Johnson were two of the first players uh, in the years past I identified as a low core. Yeah. But, you know, and the thing is, he's got to get matched up. And what does low yeah. core players do? What kind of grip do they have, Lori? They have a strong grip. It's interesting how he has that bent left arm at that impact and people talked about that, but that just gives him a lot of shaft lean and it matches yep. what he does. Yep. Now to me, low core players like Jordan and Dustin Johnson and my Kathleen, Kathleen's right here. And if we look at her at impact, you know, you see that I've only measured 12 low core players doc out of 840. Yeah, I call them ghost. You don't really see him much. Now, I know you measure, you, you've you been to South Korea a couple times and worked with the LPGA Tour players over there. So you saw some low and mid-core players. Uh, but Yeah, you know, uh, the women in South Korea, 120, 60, uh, one day, 60 the next. We had no upper core, core all lower and mid. Now, the, granted, there can also be instruction they've had. Yeah. But it's interesting how... If I brought up some of my ladies that I've had that are good players in their 50s, a lot of them end up being this, uh, you know, they end up being low core. They end up being right here in the one, two, or they end up, my ladies that are 
over 50 end up being upper core here. They end up being a seven and eight or a nine. Most of the time they end up being sevens, Doc. So pretty interesting stuff here. So there's your low core player again. Strongest grip, pivot around the trail leg, have the most lateral motion in the backswing, least rotation. And then they shift and rotate like crazy and have the latest release. And then Laurie, go over the mid core player characteristics. The grip is in between the lower core and upper core. And the pivot's gonna be more center, moderate lateral movement and rotation going through. So my hips are about 45 degrees at impact, rotated about 45 degrees. And you saw my release point, which is a little bit further past when an upper core, but not as far as the uh, low core. So it's just a hybrid of the two, the upper core and the low core. Yeah, it really is. But it, Doc, it's the swing that so many people want. People, uh, I wanted it. You know, if I if I go here and, and go back to that V1 and, and show this, you know, if, if I bring me up here at impact and show me at impact, well, I look at me and I look at Lori and I like, I want to be Lori. I, and so in my logic, the longer the club head took to get to the ball, the more rotated I could be. And I thought that would be better. And then the next thing I knew, I started hitting these balls over here to the right. Because that club, when that club drops back and behind us, uh, we get in some, some big trouble here, you know, with, uh, with what happens to us with, uh, you know, our golf swings. So That image you just had, by the way, Larry, was, um, we'll go back, if you can go back to that in a moment. Okay. And. Uh, Look at your center of mass. For years, if I saw that in a golf swing, the one you just had, center of mass being left golf swing, right? We that be that reverse pivot, right? And we no we have to get off. No, we have to get you back to the trail side. We right. Get you off the side. Ever hear that instruction? Well, it's interesting to me. I, I, I like to simplify things for my students. So if they turn this right hip and feel like they pivot around their right foot, and as Jack Nicholas said, if they feel like they keep this back at the target as long as they can, you're not going to do it, but that's a feel. And you feel the arms and hands catching up and going by the chest. This is a drill that you know I'm giving my students all the time. It's set up with these feet closed and turn and then just feel this freedom of the club swinging past you and right. you know we we get a lot of upper core players that show up first with too strong of a grip too small of a grip which is going to make you release earlier and they also have their clubs too upright so they have a triple closed club face built in Lori. and now what are they going to do to try and hit the ball at their target well, they're going to rotate through because they're probably hooking it. Yeah, so they're going to hang so, on and, and try and, you know, and try and turn through. So, you know, that, that's the, the things that happen, you know, when, when we see people that are off. But it's interesting to me how you get one piece of the puzzle wrong and your swing doesn't work. So if you get your pivot wrong, Lori... Uh, if you're an upper core player and you're trying to get to your right foot, as you said, that that's not going to work. No, if you're, it's if you're not. a low core player and you're trying to pivot around your front leg, that's not going to work. Uh, if you're an upper core player and you're trying to lag the club and rotate, that's not going to work. But Doc, if you're a low core player, that works for you, doesn't it? Works great. Yeah. So really, we have a, more pieces of the puzzle here for for these things but you know it's just interesting how we can really simplify it to a few things and and go through this so here are the carrying angles how we get the grip and once we establish the grip i have what we call doc a complementary grip where my carrying angle is the same so there is my shaft of my club and my carrying angle and all i yeah, gotta do now 
as an upper core player is bend from the waist and uh, and then set my knees and I can get in my posture, can I? Right, right. That's what that's what I was saying earlier. The shaft angle to the ground is your carrying angle, right? That shaft angle is going to be 159. Right. So it's this angle right here. And then that, if we had that digital protractor or whatever it's called, but if I pick a, another color here like yellow, but you can see here how there, that's how we get it. And interestingly enough, Doc, that ends up giving us ball position, doesn't it? It does, yes. Where, where that is as well. So we've been talking about uh, grip size here. And you have this chart that you've come up with, Doc, where we measure the middle finger of both hands. And then we measure the palm width of both hands. And that ends up, that's another algorithm that you and Dr. James Smith came up with. Your dominant core region plays into that. So if the three of us had the same size hands and I'm upper and Lori's mid and you're low, Doc, who has the largest grip? I'm going to have the largest grips. Uh, and you'll have the smallest and Laura will be somewhere in between. So having your dominant core region, that is big. And now that I have this hand up here, Doc, you know, we can really talk about kind of where, where uh, the power spot is in the hand. So me as a nine, I'm right there in that first pad, aren't I, of my middle yes. And then Lori, as as a mid-core player, she's right in the knuckle. Correct? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And then Lori, you as uh, our doc, you as a low-core player, you're going to be in the next pad, aren't you? I am. That's going to, each of those will change grip strength. Right. And it's interesting how you know, we have this uh, we have this spot here, right here, right here, and right here. It's interesting, Doc. When I measure people, I've probably done it 600 times now, and I give them the correct grip size in both hands. How they feel that spot? It's it's pretty remarkable what you've done with the science. It really is. Well, we've looked at grip size longer than stance width. Grip size is really all began in early 90s, late 80s. Yeah. So grip so it, size, what grip size does, if you simple to test, if you have a tape like a cue stick or a baseball bat, you start at the thin end, bought at the handle on the knob on the baseball bat, stand in one stance width, and slowly let your hands go up the bat or the cue stick. As the grip's bigger, you'll feel your weight move toward your heels. So it's an easy test. The hips will actually will square up when the grip size is correct. Wow. Well, that's a big and part, Doc, about... Like core region. That's a big part with what this is all about, is getting the body in symmetry because in symmetry we have strength and you we can do tests when somebody has an incorrect grip size versus a correct grip size and they're going to test having more strength with the correct grip size aren't they that's correct yeah you stand behind them you take your uh, have them take up to the top and place one hand at the uh, at the grip the other hand at the hosel and push on the downswing plane, you cannot budge them if they have the correct grip size. If they don't, they fall right over. Yeah. So pretty important. And it's rare that a standard size grip is the correct grip size for someone, isn't it, Lori? That's, yes. Yeah, it is. It's very rare. Yeah. I have to say, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, you think of grip size and how... I ended up going probably about four wraps of tape larger than I was playing with based on my hand size. And 
I always had trouble in my right elbow and, and now I'm not feeling that hyperextension in the right elbow as much. Uh, so getting the correct grip size, getting the stance width, Doc, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty important. You know, we talked about that again. I just want to go back to this one uh, picture here. But you see me standing in my nine stance width here if I bring it up. Let me bring this. Uh, I think I'm still sharing this. But if you look at my, oh, I think I'm sharing the V1 there. So let's get back to this screen. But you can see here, I'm in my nine stance width, and Doc, one inch makes a difference, doesn't it? It does, yeah. When we measure, when I have tour players come in, they almost always have a great stance width for their irons. Not always for their woods, and they're looking for it in the putter. Yeah. But having the correct stance width, and people always ask, well, how do I do this when I go play, Lori? But you kind of get a feel for it. I, I went out in the yard today. I was swinging my super speed sticks, and I got my yardstick out, and shoot, I was setting up right in my driver's stance width, just normal and natural, where I needed to be. You know, I, I've had students that just hold their hands like this down, down by their hips and just feel like they're going to lift something heavy, Doc, and and all of a sudden they just go right to their correct stance width. I, I believe that God made our body smart. We're going to stand in a stance width where we have strength. Yeah, you will. It, it's something that once you have awareness, I hear that all the time uh, from players. We're going to find this on the golf course. Once you have the body awareness, you start to go to it very quickly. Yep, and, the, and those stance widths, as we talked about, they, it basically determines what your body can and cannot do. And so I bet you've seen students, I've seen them, Lori, that are trying to clear their hips. Boy, you know, that's, that's just such not the thing to do as an upper core player. But, well, it's only a small percentage. The low core is the smallest percentage, so it's really only a small percentage of the population that need to do that. Right. Yeah, and it's it's pretty interesting. Let's talk about something I think that is uh, is pretty interesting here. If we go back into V1 and look at this. So if you look at me on the left, I think one thing we hear a lot about in teaching is the arm swing has to match up with the pivot. So the upper core player, believe it or not, Doc, they swing the club past their chest, and that momentum of the club and the way we use the ground with our feet pulls us around to our finish, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, they let the club head pull you through on the upper core. And then if we look at Lori, so Lori, Lori has to match up. So she's got to get her arms back in front of her chest. And Lori, when you and I worked a little bit, some of the time you get your, your rotation ahead of your arms and hands, don't you? Yes, I do. And that's the uh, behind club, or club, and that's what gets you in trouble. Right. So I needed to get the club down more in front of me. Right. And then low core, like Kathleen, I mean, she's, th this person, she's going to rotate and lag so her arms are where doc way behind her chest aren't they so there's low core so low core the body rotation leads and the arms and hands follow upper core doc dead opposite isn't it i mean upper core if you look at me here Upper court's the dead opposite. I want my arms and hands. I want that club head going by me. I want that club head going by me right in here. And there's where our speed comes from, Doc, doesn't it? It does, and the speed is coming from rotation and vertical movement. And, uh, in the ground, it's, but it's also, it's also coming from my arms, hands, and wrists whipping this club. Look how far this club is moving. 
Yeah, exactly. Look at your look at your release here. I was about to say, look how quickly the wrists turn over here. There you go. So look how far the club has moved here, and look how little the body's rotated. Yep. And yet everybody, this connected swing, keep the arms and chest to connect it and move together. That's just a major club head speed loss when somebody does that. You know, if they're doing that, that's just really, you know, something that is not going to work. But as we have a few minutes left here, it really comes down to getting matched up and going to a right balance fitter, finding out if you're an upper, mid, or low core player. Uh, and I have to say, as a golf instructor now, Doc, it, it's just so great that I have a system where I'm not guessing. And I know, I know now if they're upper core, mid core, low core, I know how they should pivot. I can measure their, their carrying angle and know where their, their grip should be in both hands and also know how they should sequence, Lori, how, how that sequence works from the top. Right. It tells you quite a bit of information. Like you said, it's a roadmap and it's very accurate. And what we can really yeah. do, Doc, is we can explain the different swings on the tour, whether we're looking at Lee Trevino, Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, you know, or uh, Al Guyberger. I mean, and we even today have swings so different whether you're Dustin Johnson or Patrick Reed or the pretty swings like uh, Adam Scott. So it's, it's, it's really about finding your swing. And Lori, when it comes to competition, how much can you really be thinking? You're going to be able to repeat what you can do naturally, aren't you? I, the most I could ever have was one swing thought. And it, if I had a target thought, I played much better. So under the gun, you really can't can't think about different positions in your swing. Right. And it's really a doc. It's just about, you know, for me, the missing link was I kept thinking I needed to rotate and lag the club. And that was the cancer. That's what hurt me. Now I feel my back at the target and the club going by me. And all of a sudden now I can play golf again. Well, and as, as we were students, one of the things I would say it makes it so simple. For them, they can go to sit, they can go practice their stance with, they can practice their, they can practice the thing at home in their living room, side yard, or wherever. And then once they practice that, they can go range. They're not looking for positions. This is not a uh, method or system. It is about, everything is about balance. You find the foundation, you have it. Yep. And you have it, and the thing is, after one session of a lesson with the right balance fitting, when people come back, I know what they need to do. And Lori, I know you've had students where they they leave for a couple of weeks, they're hitting it great, and then they call you and say, hey, I'm not hitting it as well. And they show up, and they're set up like they were when they showed up the last time. And you get the grip wow. correct and get their, their stance width correct and their posture correct. And guess what happens? We all tend to go back to what we we're doing. So yeah, it's always. Do. Uh, yeah, Lee Trevino called it a revolving door. <laughs> a revolving door. Well, it's been great it's to have a... you two on uh, Larry Rinker Golf Live today. I want to uh, bring up a screen where. People can find out uh, more about us and where you can find us and LarryRinker.com. For me, LaurieRinker.com. And if you want to learn more about Right Balance, RightBalanceTechnology.com. And it, it's been great having both of you on uh, the show today. Well, thank, thank you, Larry. Me. I'd like to thank my sponsors and also my producer, Chris Taylor. But my sponsors, Titleist, Foot Joy, the Ritz-Carlton Golf Club Orlando, and the Red Sky Golf Club in Vail, Colorado. 
For more information, please visit these websites, LarryRinker.com, LaurieRinker.com, RightBalanceTechnology.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at Larry Rinker. I'm Larry Rinker. You've been listening to Larry Rinker Golf Live. Till next time, keep swinging.